The battle unleashed by German General Erich von Falkenhayn in February 1916 was extraordinary, in that his only goal was to kill, not to capture ground. The fighting prompted acts of extraordinary heroism and also prompted slaughter on a terrifying scale. Very nearly one death per minute, night and day, for the entire 10-month duration of the battle. Verdun became a symbol of the French will to resist, and what happened here determined the course of the war. Ninety years on, for many French men and women, Verdun still has an iconic significance. But what bearing does it have on that titanic struggle which looms so large in British history? The Battle of the Somme, which began in July 1916. In my view, it is impossible to understand one without studying the other. How was it that the Battle of Verdun led inexorably to hundreds of thousands of British casualties on the Western Front? I mean to cast a soldier's eye on the strategy and tactics of these huge battles, to offer a glimpse inside the minds of the generals who fought them. From February to December 1916, Verdun became the most heavily bombarded place on Earth. To me, these pictures suggest Berlin, Hamburg, Germany 1945, after years of pounding by Allied heavy bombers. But this destruction wasn't the result of aerial bombing. It was caused by German artillery shells, each one of them loaded by hand, aimed, and then fired, sometimes from a distance of 25 miles. Verdun's a tiny city. Some people would call it a town, with only 22,000 inhabitants, then and now. During just one four-month period of the battle, 24 million shells were fired by German and French artillery in the Verdun sector. That's more than two shells every second, night and day. Why was this whirlwind of destruction unleashed on a charming little city like Verdun? By 1916, all hopes of a quick victory for Germany and her allies had been dashed. The armies that had charged through Belgium and much of France in 1914 had been repulsed, and the Western Front had now experienced 12 months of stalemate, trench warfare. The German Kaiser, Wilhelm II, had expected to be in Paris long before this. Falkenhayn, his commander-in-chief, needed to renew the pressure on the French, to crush them. But where and how? It's the answer to that question that makes the saga of Verdun especially poignant and especially sinister. Von Falkenhayn planned to fight a battle of attrition, slaughter on a massive scale. His aim, he said, was to bleed France white. But why here? Why is they're done? Situated in northeast France, close to the German border, Verdun had several times in history been a battleground for these two warring nations. Most recently, it was the scene of a heroic siege in the Franco-Prussian War of 1871. Only after Paris had capitulated did Verdun surrender. Falkenhayn knew that if they posed a threat to Verdun, that because of its mystical, almost religious significance to the French, they would defend it come what may. It actually made very little military sense to hang on to Verdun, but he knew that they would. And to defend it, they would feed in more and more and more troops. So as long as he kept threatening it, he could simply kill more and more Frenchmen. Verdun was to be the bait in a gigantic trap. Falkenhayn reckoned he could use mainly artillery to pick off the newly arrived defenders in their thousands. His utterly chilling calculation 
was to achieve five dead Frenchmen for every two dead Germans. The French believed Verdun to be invincible. The city itself was heavily fortified, but huge sums had also been spent constructing a ring of forts between three and 10 miles from the city boundary. I've come to one of those forts, which were designed to protect Verdun. This is Fort Dormont, showing the signs of the incredible pounding it took during the battle. It's the largest of the forts, and in 1916 said to be the strongest fortified position in the entire world. You can see from up here why it's so important. At about 1,300 feet above sea level, it's the highest point within about a 20-mile radius and forms part of what soldiers call the vital ground. What's visible on the outside barely indicates how large and powerful the fortress was. Deep below these grassy slopes are a massive roof comprising a layer of concrete, below that sand, then stone, altogether 30 feet thick and all designed to withstand plunging shell fire from long-range enemy howitzers or siege artillery. Inside, Dormont was like a small town, with a maze of stone galleries leading to barrack rooms where the garrison of roughly 500 soldiers slept, alongside storerooms for food and ammunition. Guns bristled from every angle. This, the 75mm medium-range weapon. Construction began in 1885 and went on right up until 1913, costing six million gold francs, 245 million pounds today, a sum which would have paid the wages of 300,000 French soldiers for a year. Dormont was a source of huge national pride. The defences of the fort were essentially an outer ring of barbed wire, inside which there was a deep ditch. Once you got into the ditch, you would be brought under fire from machine guns. On the roof, more artillery in rotating steel cupolas. Their task was not to defend this fort, but to fire on other forts in the vicinity, in the same way as their job was to fire on this fort when it was attacked, and they were all, as we soldiers would call it, mutually supporting. The battered hulk of Fort Dormont is just visible from the top of its smaller neighbour, Fort Vaux. The French people believe these forts formed an impregnable wall of concrete and steel. That's what they believed. Despite its key position, Verdun had been enjoying a relatively quiet war. Life inside the forts was much safer and much more comfortable than huddling in a muddy trench further up the Western Front. Guarding Verdun was a cushy number, often a posting for second-rate troops. Some French officers worried that Verdun was a weak spot, and the Germans were about to test that view. The attack would be codenamed Operation Gericht. Gericht means place of trial or judgment. Verdun was to be the critical trial of strength. The French had built outer defences, strong points and bunkers in the heavily wooded country leading down to the Meuse. They would be the Germans' first targets. As a general, I want to achieve an element of surprise, but how am I going to secretly assemble the vast quantity of weapons and ammunition that I'm going to need? The materiel ordered for the assault on Verdun was on a huge scale. The Germans brought up over 850 artillery pieces, including railway-mounted siege guns, 
A key factor in the decision to target Verdun was the excellent German railway network in this zone. Munitions factories had turned out some two and a half million artillery shells simply for the initial phases of the bombardment and assault. Getting these to the front line, let alone the men, required 1,300 train loads, a massive and highly visible exercise in logistics. Today, I'd be supplied with a mass of surveillance data from aerial reconnaissance, from unmanned, remotely controlled small aircraft known as UAVs, and from satellites. The Germans had seized the initiative before the battle began and largely cleared the skies of French reconnaissance planes. The French are getting very few indications of what's going on. The Germans were pretty careful not to let anyone go backwards and forwards between their lines and the French, so the French weren't getting anything from the agents in place. And then there was what we now call SIGINT, signals intelligence, in other words, listening to what the enemy is saying on the radio and on the telephone. Now, they weren't able to intercept the Germans' telephone communications because they were running back to army headquarters and then back to Berlin. Now, the Germans did have radios, but there were very few of them. They weren't portable. There were huge, great things, usually at core headquarters. So there was nothing like the traffic that you'd expect now. In fact, the first warning that the Germans were going to attack at Verdun was picked up by the British Royal Naval attaché at a cocktail party in Oslo. The Verdun garrison had no inkling of the storm that was about to break. One has to admire the way the Germans achieved almost complete tactical surprise. Everything had been meticulously planned. The first attack required 72 battalions. That's 72,000 men. They were infiltrated by night, and housed in over a hundred underground bunkers called Stollen here in the forest. With this huge force poised to attack, the Germans hit a last minute snag. The weather had been poor in early February. In fact, the start date for Operation Gericht was postponed three times because of it. Good visibility was vital for the artillery. Today, my artillery commander would punch in some map coordinates and the multi-launch rocket systems would hit the targets with the first round. In 1916, artillery had to be directed largely by sight. They might raise a tethered balloon with a telephone line running back down to ground for the spotter to notify the fall of shot. But this needed calm weather and clear skies. Finally, on Monday, February the 21st, 1916, visibility had cleared. It was time to attack. Although on nothing like this scale, I've been in the same position as a young officer approaching zero hour. And then you wonder, are you going to let the side down? Are you going to come out of this alive? I've known what it is to be a commander too, waiting for the battle to begin. The success or failure of my country's plans may hang on the outcome. It is a nerve wracking moment. <laughs> The shelling of the city began at precisely 7.12 a.m. The first of the many millions which were to fall, a round from a long-range 15-inch naval gun, hit the cathedral. In the propaganda of the time, it was put down to what the British called German frightfulness but was probably a shot aimed at one of the bridges that went astray. The next salvo did better, crashing down on the railway station. For the defending troops, 10 miles north of Verdun city, 
The artillery barrage directed their way must have been utterly terrifying. The Germans called it Trommelfeuer, or Drumfeuer, a continuous crash as one shell after another plummeted down or burst in the air, spreading shrapnel in all directions. Every one of these dips and hummocks is a shell hole, 90 years old. The trenches, where men huddled for protection from the devastating barrage, still snake their way through a newly grown forest. Every tree was turned to matchwood by the shell fire of 1916. Once the barrage lifted, at 4 p.m., the German assault troops began to swarm forward on a 19-mile front. A flamethrower attack on men of the French 51st Division wreaked havoc, sending them back in total disorder, many of them with their hair and clothes on fire. Could anyone stem this tidal wave of German infantry? Here, in what's known as the Bois de Col, an especially fiery character stood in their way, and this is his command post. Emile Drion was something of a Winston Churchill figure, in that he was half politician, half military man, and a popular writer, too. Drion was an elected deputy in the French Parliament, on the outbreak of war, approaching 60, he re-enlisted as a lieutenant colonel. He complained loud and often that Verdun was a disaster waiting to happen, which infuriated the army brass. But now Drion's warnings were being borne out, and he was right here in the front line, commanding two battalions of chasseurs, or light infantry. Drion had 1,200 men confronting 10,000 assault troops from the German 21st Division. He'd gone to help one of his wounded men when a machine gun bullet hit him in the forehead, killing him outright. He hadn't been able to delay the advance by much, but the story of Drion's last stand certainly served to inspire the rest of the army. The material effect of our bombardment had been rather below our expectations. The moral effect, however, was immense. Everywhere the infantry encountered only slight resistance. Thus the verdict on the first day of the attack from the German general on the spot. The Kaiser's son, Crown Prince Wilhelm. The eldest of the Kaiser's five sons, the prince was 33 years old and didn't look very soldierly. All through the war, he was painted as a figure of fun, dubbed Little Willie. But his military record belied his appearance. The prince had commanded the Fifth Army since August 1914 and commanded it well. As the battle unfolded, Little Willie's instincts turned out to be better than those of the higher commanders. He realised that to say to soldiers, I want you to attack something and threaten it, but not to actually capture it, uh, risk your life, might well get killed, but I don't actually want you to take that objective, then it's actually very difficult to say to a soldier, and it's a very difficult thing to do anyway. And his orders to his army talked about capturing Verdun. 
Now, of course, from Falkenhayn's point of view, he didn't want to capture Verdun, because if he did, the whole point of the operation, sucking in more and more French troops and killing them, would go out the window. So right from the beginning, you've got this dichotomy between the two. The man who's actually got to do the job and the commander-in-chief who doesn't want Verdun to be actually captured. Squabbles in the German high command weren't known and were of little consequence right now for the embattled French fighting for their lives to hold back the advancing waves. Defensive outposts were being overrun and the citizens were desperate to escape the city as the Germans surged forward towards Verdun's ring of fortresses. The task of holding them back was assigned to this man, General Henri Philippe Pétain. Pétain at 59 was no firebrand, more a safe pair of hands. He was an infantry officer, but understood the value of artillery firepower. With a reputation also as a logistics wizard, he seemed a good choice to manage a long, drawn-out defensive battle. Pétain drove through the night from Paris to here, Sui, where he set up his headquarters in the town hall. On the first day of his appointment, February the 25th, came an event that elevated this battle into a matter of national importance for France, triggered by something almost farcical at Fort Dormont. Capturing the fort was the key to Falkenhayn's secret plan. If my true strategy is to draw the French into a position in which they can be annihilated, I have to capture the vital ground and threaten to make the city untenable. In the early assault, the fort had been hit several times, but still presented a major obstacle. Or so the Germans believed. These mighty-looking forts were pretty well defenceless. The French had concluded from what had happened in 1914 that forts actually weren't any use anymore. Uh, the Belgian forts and some of their own frontier forts had either been bypassed or shelled into submission. And that's why they started to denude their forts of guns. And indeed, the big guns were taken out of them before the Verdun offensive had started. Dumont, which had been the strongest fort in the world, was no longer so. It was really just a pile of concrete with some not terribly effective guns. What the Germans didn't realise was that instead of the regular garrison of 500 men, there were just 58 territorials, older soldiers recalled for local duty and a warrant officer. Instead of manning what defences were left, most of them were sheltering deep in the bowels of the fortress. Nine pioneers of the 24th Brandenburg Regiment, led by Sergeant Kuntz, crept close up to the fortress, confused as to why no one was shooting at them. Chancing their luck even further, they spotted an open gun port. The sergeant ordered his men to form a human pyramid. Kuntz climbed up and squeezed inside. Before long, more German soldiers appeared, some 90 troops in total. They spread around the galleries, and the horrified French gun crews put their hands in the air. The mightiest fort in France had fallen without a shot being fired. In Verdun city, there was panic. One officer ran amuck, shouting, Sauve qui peur, every man for himself. He was quickly arrested. The unthinkable had happened. The crown prince had seized Dormont. Germany was winning. Not just this battle, maybe the war. A local historian who studied this battle, Ingrid Ferrand, is herself German. Could you tell us what the reaction was in Germany to the capture of this great fort? Oh, the reaction in Germany, you can imagine. All the newspapers were full. The, the Grand Fortress, Duomo was taken. And the, the children, they had no school, and there was bank holidays for everybody, and all the bells were ringing. Everybody thought the war will be over. Of course, it was as well a matter of propaganda. 
But it was as well very good for the German soldiers. You have to think, they were not in their own country. They had no barracks, they had no hospital, no ammunition dump. And a big fortress like this, you know, uh, it can be useful, of course. Petain had a crisis on his hands. But in tactical terms, the Germans had made a glaring error. That was to attack just on the east or right bank of the Meurs, rather than on both banks at the same time. What I would do is quickly get my own artillery into place here and pound the German flanks as they push forward to the city. That is precisely what Petar now did. It was what the Americans might call a turkey shoot. The French artillery now firing at clearly visible targets. Even their ancient 155 millimeter guns were called into play and wreaked terrible havoc. The body count was not stacking up, quite as Falkenhayn hoped. After six weeks fighting at the end of March, French casualties were 88,000 and the Germans 82,000. It appears that our losses are more terrible than I understood. I have just met Ludwig Heller, my comrade in the 29th. He is in charge of the burial parties and gives me terrible news. A Feldwebel, or Sergeant Major, with the German 243rd Regiment, Karl Gartner, had written a long and detailed letter describing conditions during the assault. He was expecting that a friend about to go on leave would deliver it in person to his mother. Instead, Gartner was captured and the letter too. We have been badly informed by our officers. We are just maintaining our positions on the ground we have won after fearful losses. And we must give up all hope of taking Verdun. So despite their early success, were the Germans now running into trouble? How well equipped were the Crown Prince's men? The uniform here is, is typical of a soldier of 1916. It has ammunition pouches made of leather. Um, it takes total 90 rounds, it's not many. The rifle is the Gewehr 1898 and it takes five rounds in the magazine, uh, not 10 rounds as in a, a British weapon. And on the head, he's wearing the pickle halb, which is really a parade helmet with a cover over it. it. It really doesn't provide any protection. But during the Battle of Verdun, you actually get to have this thing, which is the Stahlhelm, the steel helmet, which is an incredibly distinctive German item, which we all recognize now. It's a very good helmet, isn't it? It is. Actually, better than the, either the French or British helmet. Yeah, far superior. Everything else is old-fashioned, there's lots of leather in it, and there were even problems with a nice shiny belt buckle, which was nice for parade wear, had to be painted so it wouldn't glint and give the soldiers position away. It's not the most modern set of uniform or weapons in action. And although we tend to imagine today sort of fondly that the German army is highly efficient and superb, they have lots and lots of problems, which means they are not as effective as they might have been. For their part, the French also had some modernizing to do. Logistics is the lifeblood of war. When Pétain took command, his position was desperate. He needed an efficient way of channeling men and materials into Verdun, what the military call a main supply route. The most famous stretch of road in the whole of France snakes for 40 miles towards Verdun. Every kilometre, there's a stone marker with a helmet on it, telling us that this is the Voie Sacrée, the sacred way. That's the name which was given to the road to Verdun, since the men and materiel which moved along it would have to save the city, perhaps the nation, from defeat. Pétain gave top priority to improving what had been a narrow, twisting road. He divided the section between Verdun and the regional capital, bar le duc into seven cantons, each with its squad of road builders. 
Broken down vehicles were just dragged aside so as not to halt the traffic. The whole of France was scarred for spare trucks, including those which had hitherto delivered groceries for the Paris fruit and veg market. The Voie Sacre was a never-ending convoy stretching for mile after mile. At its height, a vehicle or baggage wagon passed a given spot every 14 seconds, night and day. The French were pulling in troops from wherever they could. Colonial forces from North Africa, from Senegal, from Indochina. Some to fight, others to work as laborers on the Voie Sacre. The French couldn't afford to let up, but then neither could the Germans. They saw Verdun as the key to winning the war. What was Germany's long-term strategy? Her key enemy was not France, but Great Britain, or England, as Falkenhayn would have said. The Germans initially hoped that the British would not come into the war, not because of the British army, which was tiny and, and so far really wasn't having much effect on the Western Front, but because of the Royal Navy, which was stopping the Germans importing things that they needed, foodstuffs and, and raw materials, and of course because of Britain's pocket. Britain was the richest country in the coalition against it. Britain was the richest country in the world. Britain was making loans to the French, most of which weren't being paid back. And as far as the Germans could see, it was British money that was keeping the coalition against them going and the Royal Navy that was eventually going to strangle them. Falkenhayn reasoned that he could, as he put it, remove the strongest sword from Britain's hand by knocking out the French. It was to prevent that happening that the British would fight their most costly and controversial battle of the war, the Battle of the Somme. At a summit of Allied leaders in December 1915, Britain had agreed to take part in a major combined Anglo-French offensive set for August 1916. Planning was barely underway when the Germans unleashed their ferocious assault on Verdun. Now, instead of supplying 40 divisions for the Battle of the Somme, French Commander-in-Chief Joseph Joffre made it clear he could only spare five. As the Verdun battle goes on, Verdun is the focus of the whole of the French army on the Western Front. Everything else that they do is effectively closed down. They go on the defensive. On the Somme, Britain's army of raw recruits would have to bear the brunt of the fighting. And what's more, August would be too late, because the Battle of Verdun was nearing crisis point. Mortom, or Dead Man's Hill, lies seven miles northwest of Verdun. The name turned out to be very prescient. It's around there that some of the bitterest fighting took place from March until almost the end of May. The Germans had recognized that the decision to attack only on the right bank of the Meuse was a serious error. Now they planned a renewed double-pronged assault to take this hill on the left bank and the next fort in the chain, Fort Vaux on the right bank. As so often happens in war, in order to get from A to B, you have to go via C. And as the Germans began to fight their way onto Le Morton over there, they came under intense artillery fire from French guns on Hill 304 over there. And so a ferocious struggle now began for Hill 304 with seven German divisions ordered to take the summit. The Germans attacked in big columns of 500 men, preceded by waves of sharpshooters. It is absolutely impossible to describe what losses the Germans must suffer in these attacks. Nothing can give an idea of it. 
under the storm of machine gun, rifle and artillery fire, the German columns were ploughed into furrows of death. It was during this fight that another of the legendary incidents of the Battle of Verdun occurred, suggesting that sometimes at least the pen is as mighty as the sword. The Voie Sacre ran right beneath Pétain's office window in the high street of Sui. He would stand on the balcony and watch the troops passing, knowing that by the end of May, 23,000 men had died. 54,000 were missing. 75,000 were wounded, 152,000 casualties in three months. But the enemy was suffering too. With the Germans now taking a severe pounding at Le Morton, Pétain issued his famous order of the day, which reads in part, The furious attacks of the soldiers of the Crown Prince have broken down everywhere. Honor to all. Courage. On les aura. It's those last three words which went down in history. On les aura, loosely translated in soldiers' language. We'll have them. The ferocity of the fighting is something that even I find hard to imagine. This is Fort Vaux, the scene of such intense combat that the stone and concrete facade came to look more like a series of caves. Vaux was the next strong point on the Germans' hit list. But in early summer, it was still in French hands. After the shame of Fort Dormont, the French decided to hang on to their remaining forts at all costs. But would anyone volunteer to take command in what was practically a suicide mission? HQ said a wounded officer would do, since he'd almost certainly be killed or captured. And so it was that 49-year-old, three times wounded, Major Reynal hobbled forward to take on this task. Initially, Reynal had 600 men under his command, armed with rifles, machine guns and grenades. They knew it was only a matter of time before the Germans burst into the fort and so built barricades in the tunnels themselves. The Germans fought their way into the outer galleries and then a terrible battle began, lit by flashes of gunfire. There were explosions of grenades and with horrific results, flamethrowers. An even more powerful enemy now threatened the French. The level of drinking water in the fort system had been wrongly measured, and now the defenders were on the brink of dying of thirst. They licked moisture from the stone walls. Some even drank their own urine. They'd held back the German Sixth Army for a week, but were now completely cut off, only able to communicate by carrier pigeon. Renal sent off his last bird with a message outlining his desperate plight to his area commander at the citadel of Verdun. The pigeon, named Valiant, itself fell dead and was awarded the Légion d'Honneur. Renal, like the pigeon, had done all he could. With the few surviving troops, he finally surrendered. One of the survivors he is dead now as well, Mr. Vivies. He told us, you know, when we came out of the fort, we were mad, so we, we, had, we were thirsty, you know, and we saw the shell holes full of water. We went in, all our head in the water, we drank, we drank, and just afterwards we saw there are dead bodies in already. Reynal was photographed with his captors and taken to meet the Crown Prince, who presented him with a sword of honour. But the Prince perhaps had other things on his mind. 
the conflict at the top of the German high command had begun to unravel. Although after four months' combat, the French were battle-weary, they were still fighting. Pétain, when he takes over, realises that for morale, you've got to retake men. You mustn't leave them in there forever when they cannot possibly see an end to it. Uh, you must retake them. So he begins moving divisions into Verdun and out again. Now, from the German point of view, because of this dichotomy between Falkenhayn, who doesn't want Verdun to be captured, and Crown Prince William, who does, Falkenheim is keeping him starved of troops, and therefore he's not able to rotate to anything like the same extent that the French can. This falling out at the top proved critical. The German tide of victory was about to reach its high watermark. Their next key target was here, Fort Souville, only three miles from Verdun itself. On the 22nd of June, the Germans employed a new tactic. Shells falling on French artillery positions exploded, not with a bang, but with a pop, followed by a pungent smell. Gas. But the defenders were prepared. Gas had been used by the Germans in other sectors previously, and most of the French troops had been issued with gas masks. Or if not, had devised their own. On this occasion, the French gas masks worked quite well. The attack was on too narrow a front, and although the French line was badly dented, it held. The main body of German troops tried to battle their way through the French defence lines, coming within a thousand yards of Fort Souville, but were then halted. Only a small contingent from the 140th Regiment reached the top of the fort, from which at last they could see the spars of Verdun glinting in the valley below, but they were driven off. The tide had finally turned. Soon, the Germans would be on the defensive, not just here, but on the Somme. On the 1st of July, 1916, the long-planned Anglo-French offensive had begun. Despite almost 60,000 Allied casualties on the opening day and heavy losses thereafter, it was clear to the Germans that this was the big push that had been rumoured for so long. Verdun was no longer centre stage. On July the 12th, the offensive at Verdun was abandoned. Falkenhayn's strategy of slaughter had proved as deadly for Germany as it had for France. In August, he was dismissed. His successor, Paul von Hindenburg, the Kaiser's instructions now were to find the least costly way of shutting down the Verdun front. But just as the Germans were forced to withdraw troops to meet the new crisis on the Somme, the French were gathering a powerful army to hit those left behind at Verdun. Now began the period the French called their revanche, revenge. Eight and a half French divisions, 60,000 men, prepared to force the Germans back from the ground they'd won, especially Fort Dormont. The French had now called up 650 guns, including railway guns, well behind the lines. On October the 23rd, a giant shell plunged through the eight-foot-thick concrete roof of Fort Dormont, killing 50 Germans in the sick bay. Another devastated a barrack room. The fort filled with poisonous fumes and the garrison commander gave the order to abandon. Within 24 hours, Fort Dormont was back in French hands. Fort Vaux, the scene of Major Reynal's last stand, was retaken a few days later. The French had seized back ground 
that the Germans had fought for four and a half months to win. The final French assault took place in December. The Germans were pushed back almost to the line they'd started from ten months earlier. They surrendered in droves. Defeated and demoralised, 11,000 were taken prisoner and paraded through the city they'd pounded so mercilessly. The Battle of Verdun was over. But what had it achieved? And what had it cost? The French suffered 362,000 casualties, over 160,000 killed or missing. German losses were almost of the same order. 337,000 killed, wounded or captured. This was not the equation Falkenhayn had expected when he launched his total war. For France, at first just grateful to have survived, there were consequences no one could foresee. The experience at Verdun left an enduring wound on the psychology of the nation. Lieutenant Raymond Joubert, who died here, summed it up. They will not be able to make us do it again another day. The following year, the exhausted French army came close to mutiny. It was the British army who now took the main offensive role, which led to ultimate victory. Pétain is remembered now rather as the leader of the shameful Vichy regime, after Germany's conquest of France in World War II. But that is to leap forward one generation and one war. In 1916, the heroic, stubborn defence of Verdun not only saved France, but determined the course of World War I. It was a battle which produced all kinds of heroic utterances. To borrow a phrase from a little later in history, this was their finest hour. <laughs>